It is the Chinese Lunar New Year, the year of the ox, the year when Hong Kong will return to the Chinese motherland. It is a time of uncertainty. No one knows what the year will bring. These are the last months under British rule and a colonial administration that shaped Hong Kong over 150 years. A new term has been coined, not only in Hong Kong, but in all the towns and villages of the new territories, there's an overwhelming display of what they now call Chineseness. Few will mourn the departure of the British, which is little over 120 days away. But many of the six million Hong Kongese escaped communism once, and now communism is reaching out to reclaim them. The Hong Kong countdown is entering its final phase. It is time to fly paper prayers to the gods, asking for health, family happiness, and above all in this ultra-capitalist society, an appeal for prosperity. This year, the personal wishes cards carry special symbolism, because with just four months to go, still no one really knows what the future has in store. The respite of the New Year festivities is over. Hong Kong returns to teeming, noisy normality. The next great celebration will be on June the 30th, when the handover agreed 14 years ago between Margaret Thatcher and the Chinese Premier come into effect. At the stroke of midnight, Britain's long lease on the territory will run out, and the Hong Kongese will become citizens of a special administrative region of China. 6,300,000 people whose lives are affected to lesser or greater degree. Today, government lawyer Royston Griffey has made the decision to return to Britain. His Chinese wife has reluctantly agreed. Royston drafted the laws which only in recent years allowed Hong Kong its first steps towards democracy. He fears those laws will be scrapped and sees indications that China will meddle in Hong Kong's affairs in spite of promises of autonomy and non-interference for a period of 50 years. And he has just won a legal battle against his own government, accusing them of kowtowing to China by employing Chinese in preference to British officers. The Reverend Rob Gillian is staying on. His decision is made. He serves at the British Cathedral of St. John, but his chief preoccupation is to represent Hong Kong's lifers, the prisoners in the high security jail where he is chaplain. Many prisoners live in terror that China will extend its ruthless punishment code across the border. Rob Gillian will be their watchdog. Hong Kong has time markers in its daily rhythm. 9.30 a.m. to the second, the changing of the guard at Hong Kong's military headquarters. It's the Royal Highland Regiment, the Black Watch, who have been chosen to be the final garrison. They have the ceremonial look, which will ensure Britain ends its history as a colonial power with dignity. Colonel Alistair Loudon, the commanding officer of the 1st Battalion, is charged with dismantling the garrison. Today, another company of soldiers returns to Scotland, leaving the bare minimum to maintain Hong Kong's sovereign integrity up to the very last second of British rule. Guarding and the guards and duties is a pest. 
which we have to do wherever we go, and we all know that, you know that, but again, the, the atmosphere that you created and the way that you talk to people and what everyone says to me and the Prince of Wales building about how you've done things is great, and it reflects on you particularly. It's because you've done a bloody good job. The headquarters of Agence France Press, where Chief Correspondent Richard Ingham monitors every move in the Battle of Wills between Britain and China. In the final months of the countdown, British influence has all but disappeared. A Chinese-approved provisional parliament is already operating, and the word on the street is that existing laws safeguarding democracy will be repealed. The fate of the Democrats is, is a very sad and, to my mind, a very alarming uh, development. The Democrats face parliamentary extinction on July the 1st. This is because the Legislative Council will be abolished and the Chinese will move in this, what they call an interim assembly, uh, the uh, provisional legislature. Now what happens after that the, is unknown. China has promised to hold new elections within a year of the handover. Now what form these elections take, whether or not the, they will be fair and open and whether or not the, the Democrats will be allowed to take part, it's still un unclear, nobody knows. What's going to happen to these people? It was the Democrats who swept to power in the last elections to be held in Hong Kong. Now the Democrats are fighting a rearguard action. There have been indications from China that the freedom of assembly, the right to demonstrate, and the right of the Democrats to have links with foreign countries are to be eroded. There are fears, too, that Democrat activists could be at personal risk. The people who are at risk in the first instance are not the people who, are, are, who have the highest profile. By this I mean people like Martin Lee, who's the chairman of the uh, Democratic Party, and Emily Lau, who's a pro-democracy independent, a very vocal and very courageous woman who has always spoken out very, very tenaciously for uh, the future of Hong Kong's democracy. The people who seem to be most at risk are the people in, who are on the fringes of the pro-democracy movement, who take part in uh, rallies whose faces are known to Chinese officials here and who are considered uh, low-profile troublemakers who can be easily harassed and silenced or maybe even jailed. You actually feel Big Brother is already here. China has already got all the institutions in place which would enable China to control Hong Kong in every important way. After the 1st of July, I think it will be very difficult for us to function as a political party, although we would certainly do our best. But we are still determined to go on because we, we believe Hong Kong people need a voice for them, and we will continue to be the voice of Hong Kong. I feel that you know, we are going to be uh, in a very difficult state after the handover not just myself, but also members of the pro-democracy lobby, uh, we are going to be obviously uh, alienated by the Chinese and they will try to get all other groups to isolate us as well. And the question of finding work for pro-democracy activists uh, could be also very difficult, but we have to earn a living. And uh, so uh, I, I think we just feel that, you know, this very heavy pressure is coming down on us more and more. But the, the thing is, uh, we don't give up. I continue fighting until they come and kill me. I've been coming here to Sheikh Pit prison now for five years, and this prison is a high security prison, out of sight, out of mind, as far as I can see from society. Many of those who've committed serious crimes are very concerned that uh, they would not be alive today if they'd been living in China.
They've got real fears. They've got real anxieties. Well, those who have uh, been given a life sentence, they're there forever. Never mind 1997. Uh, what's happening for the rest of their life? Some of them are expressing fears that they may be um, sent into China uh, because of the overcrowding of the prisons. They might deal with the overcrowding, not in building more prisons, as the British government has been doing, but actually to get rid of the prisoners. Will the death penalty be returned? I want to speak today about Hong Kong and about the uncertainties. Everybody out there is worried for all sorts of reasons. Their job. Their security. What changes will take place that will uh, affect them? But I think not many people are giving much thought to you. And sometimes it can feel very dark here, can't it? You are outside of the world. And many of you have been here for a very, very, very long time. And I would like to ask any of you what fears you do have. The British government at the moment has promised that there will be no change. The Chinese government has said no change after 97. But we all know that although one might want to maintain the status quo, things inevitably are going to change. There are going to be fears that uh, there might be uh, stricter sentences brought in, that some of the um, attitudes that they find in China against uh, criminals might start to come here. I know you've got fears of uh, your own situation, but all of you are facing uh, change. And what do you think that change might, might lead to? in terms of moving from one uh, uh, government to another? OK, I mean, most of us are living on fear. Uh, we, none of us know what will happen in the future. A lot of this in China is going to be implemented here in Hong Kong. Like in China, anybody that committed the same crime that I committed is going to be killed. Had it been that we are in China, I'm afraid none of us will be alive today. Uh, we are afraid China might come here and introduce the penalty. And none of us here will escape it. I personally have written to the governor on this issue. Uh, and, uh, the explanation he gave to me, I'm not satisfied with it. He only promised there will no change after 50 years. Uh, however, we know that China they don't keep any agreement. China, everybody knows that they don't keep agreement. There's nothing we can do on our own. This is all I have to say. Thank you, Joe. And what we really need to do is to pray for ourselves, uh, but more importantly, for Hong Kong. Uh, pray for, for peace, for, uh, for the future, not only for us, but for, the Hong, for Hong Kong as well. We pray for Hong Kong at this, uh, this time in history. We pray for all those who are afraid in any way. We pray that they may face the future with patience, perseverance and hope. Our Father,
Father, and Lord Jesus, and who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, O Lord. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. It might well have been transplanted lock, stock and barrel from the King's Road or Hyde Park corner, but the talk today in this favourite hangout of British expatriates is all about staying or going, and whether the great return to Blighty should be before or after the handover. I mean, you decided to go. Um, I've decided to stay. All my colleagues are staying. Um, my colleagues in, in school are very happy to stay. In fact, they see... A uh, number of teachers actually see a long future here. What's the main reason for their stay? Is, is it um, it's partly money, but it's also lifestyle. Yeah. And also it's partly uh, fear of going back to teach in England. Um, many people just don't, would feel lost if they went back. Anyway, Royston, you're heading back in a yes, few months. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, I'm not going back. I'm not going back by a plane. Of course, I'm going back um, on a ship. Unbelievably. You will miss Hong Kong, then? Of course, of course. I've been here 17 years, for Christ's sake. And yes. met my wife. Yes. Sons, both born in Hong Kong. Um, obviously, I've got to say, a very interesting job. I drafted the law, which I enjoyed doing. Yes. And it's been um, damn finely drafted, I may say yes. so. Um, yeah, naturally, I'm going to miss the place. For somebody in your position, I can't understand why you'd want to go before the handover. Yes, I would, I would actually, to be fair, I would like to see the transfer of sovereignty, to see the switch from British sovereignty to Chinese sovereignty. Unfortunately, unless um, something happens in the meantime, that's not going to. The ship only comes in once a year. Uh, if I miss it and... Um, watch the, the flag uh, being pulled down, uh, then I'll miss the bloody boat. But what do you think you're going to gain by going back to England? What? In, in to yourself? Avoid... In yourself, in just in your own development? Well, in just you how know, you feel. I've had such a bad, uh, bad experience with the government over the last five years, absolutely bloody five years of hell, fight, fighting them with their um, disgraceful policies over localization. Now, I, although we actually managed to beat them, a couple of weeks ago. I'm so absolutely disillusioned with the government that uh, enough is enough. Aberdeen Harbour, the floating village of the fisher folk of Hong Kong, has seen little change since the British first arrived and demanded tenure to what was then a forgotten corner of the Chinese Empire. Military defeat by Queen Victoria's regiments in the Opium Wars gave the Chinese little choice but to secede Hong Kong. Aberdeen today is a picturesque location for expat private clubs and marinas. Royston Griffey and his wife Hazel are now well ahead with arrangements to quit Hong Kong, although Hazel cannot yet envisage her future as an English country lady. I don't want to leave Hong Kong, but uh, we agree that uh, I can come back two times a year, so it's not too bad. 
Well, I'm going to miss all my friends, uh, Marjo and Carol Kay, my relatives, lots of things. Amazingly, um, I used to, to live in this same village and wonder who on earth lived in this lovely little mansion. And now it's um, on the market, so I think we ought to perhaps uh, make an offer. And look at the price very, compared, very compared to the price. well, compared with the Hong Kong prices. It's a bargain. It's very cheap for that. Well, I, I think it's I think it's um, um, a bargain price anyway. Yeah. Because if that was in Clifton, it would be at least obviously. If you lived somewhere else for a long time and then go back to the original place, you'll notice a tremendous change. But I have, unlike quite a few of the expatriates here who have foolishly, in my view, cut off links with their home countries. I have deliberately and gone out of my way to maintain those links. If you want to fit back into the society when you eventually return to it, you've got to do that sort of thing. gardens, look. And it's virtually round the corner from where I lived, just up here. So incredible coincidence. If we, if we buy that one, I should be a happy man. It is distressing to have spent a, a, a goodly part of your life producing uh, what I think is a fairly good uh, democratic system. It's not perfect by any means, um, but it's, 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 it works for Hong Kong at the moment. And it's a shame to see all that uh, being thrown away. It was uh, one of the main reasons for going. Uh, another reason, which perhaps follows on from this one, is, in my view, uh, possibly a, a, an attack on the rule of law itself. Now, as, as a lawyer, um, I'm, I'm most um, um, upset if the rule of law is under attack, because this is a, a sophisticated, modern society, and it should be run by the rule of law. If that rule of law um, comes under attack, then everyone in this community is at, uh, at some dif disadvantage. Now, I think the rule of law is under attack, and uh, s quite a few prominent members of uh, this society also think so. As a lawyer, I can't tolerate that. I would prefer to go. There's been a cricket club in Hong Kong since the very first days of the colony. Victoria's merchant venturers always recreated little reflections of England in their newly acquired lands. Against what? Against the local Hong Kong team. Royston St. Allen is in for a culture shock, a preparation for village life in Somerset. There are fewer Brits on the members list today. At the chicest of clubs, it is Chinese faces that abound. The days of white privilege are truly past. Over the last few years, uh, quite a few people have gone. Uh, whether they wanted to or not, and consequently we've, we've lost people who we've become friendly with. Uh, that process is continuing, especially in the government, because um, even if they wanted to stay, they're, they're going. Um, two or three officers who I knew for many years, 15, 16 years, uh, went last week, which was um, quite sad. Um, some of my wife's relatives have, uh, have left as well mainly to be assured of, uh, of, of a passport in, in another country. But they've nevertheless, they've gone. That process is going on all the time. Let's hope he gets a four in a minute, or a boundary. Whack. Oh, you're not very good, are you? <laughs> you didn't stop that. Are you looking forward to playing this game when we're in Bishopsworth? No. You're not? They got a, lo they got a lovely... Um... I like play soccer better. Rather play football? Yeah. I like it better. Well, you could play football in the winter and cricket in the summer. Well, it's too hot for cricket. Well, not in England, it isn't. <laughs> <laughs>
Their mission is to demonstrate to the world Britain's determination to retain sovereignty over Hong Kong until the last second. Today, an exercise in the new territories, a supposed cross-border incursion by armed smugglers. There are border observation posts to be manned, public buildings to guard, and it's the Black Watch who will be centre stage for the great handover ceremony and parade on June the 30th. Well, Black Watch is a, it's a very old regiment, it's a, it's a family regiment. My father was in the Black Watch and I've got two nephews in the Black Watch. So it's a very good family regiment and uh, it's great to be back in Hong Kong. And I think uh, two reasons that we were chosen is maybe because we were here before, we know the country, the people like us, we're a good rapport with the people and we're a very smart, colourful uniform when we're on parade. We've got a great pipe band and the, the local people enjoy the pipe music. So I don't know if that's the reason, but um, I would think that could be the reasons. Today is selection day, when a small number from the remaining 500 soldiers will be chosen to take part in the Great Parade, the Flower of Scotland. Highlanders 6,000 miles from their cold northern land, sweating it out in the heat and humidity in their heavy woolen kilts. For the favoured, weeks of drill and spit and polish lie ahead. The responsibility will be immense. They must not be outshone. The Chinese army have designed new uniforms for the Hong Kong Parade, and it's said that men of identical height will make up the honour guard. And so the whittling down process gets underway. The regimental tailor will fit out the chosen few with spanking new ceremonial kit. He makes a pre-selection. After that, it's up to the commanding officer, Colonel Loudon. Private Ferguson. Sam Easton. Cottle Sesford. Private Carson. Up. It was my duty to get the 100 best men uh, from the battalion. By best, I mean the, the sort of smartest, the, sort of the, the, the ones that would, that would give over the best picture of the Black Watch and the British Army. So it was a bit like a cattle market. You know, you had to go, and what, what criteria do you use? I had everybody together and I said, um, I'm going to go along and pretty instantly I'm going to pick those people on parade and some of you will have the little finger pointed at you and some of you will have the thumb pointed at you to go the other side and don't accuse me of being, you know, um, against your height, the way you look, your spots, anything else. I'm just picking a sort of um, a person's stature and presence really. That's been the others. I'm so. I think Court Morris was a bit. Um, um, Size-wise, I want to keep people, you know, even well built ones, I want to keep some of the, it's like the large ones, like, like, like Lumsden and Golden well Hill. Well. Um, there's no one way out of size, I think, actually. One step forward. One step forward. One step forward. One step forward. You had a great long row of jocks, um, and I'm just using my experience of, of, of being on many parades and seeing many men and imagining them standing there. This was one of the key criteria, imagine them standing there in the, in the baking evening sun uh, for half an hour, and within that, you can't linger, otherwise you, know, you could spend hours on everybody, you just have, you know, have to make a fairly instant decision. Yeah. It's just being stood here. Are you, are you very disappointed about not being on? Well, tell no. Um, I mean, obviously it wasn't any, against your size or your physique or your well, comfort or anything else. You understand that? More than likely, it's probably better after. Right. There's so many show queens at the garden. Right. Well, it was interesting to know whether whether the men really wanted to be on the parade because the alternative being on the parade might be to have the last two weeks when you can sit by the swimming pool, or you can be doing fatigues, and you haven't got to go through all this business of getting in and out of the kit and endless parades. But actually. I think the vast majority really wanted to be on the parade because it's the sort of finale and it's been built up. This is a, this, you know, 
there's one thing that's been built up is that this business of being in Hong Kong for the last five months is of huge significance. And the hugest significance is going to be that final celebration. The Black Watch have a secret weapon in the public relations showdown with the People's Liberation Army of China. The Scots have the pipes and drums, a machine gun unit which doubles as the musical flagship at the center of every ceremony. It takes hours of preparation before a pipes and drums performance. Each man is charged with checking over the finished appearance of his comrades. As part of the handle ceremony, I think as a piper, we're going to be really privileged because we play, people might think it's an unusual instrument, but to a Scotsman it's not, you see, and uh, our focus is obviously going to be part of parade, the pipes and drums, so like we're going to be the pipes and drums on parade, so for us it's going to be very, a big honour. Uh, if you think, a very small number representing the British Isles. And not only are we representing the British Isles, we're actually representing the Queen as well, because we're, it's like going to be the last handovers of the colony to a country, and we're going to be the people that are participating in this. So for every one of us that's taken part of this, it's got, it's got to be a great honour. And it's something that's not just going to, at the end of June, be forgotten about. Uh, we're going to remember it f for the rest of our lives. And obviously we'll pass it down to our families as we go along in life, that we were part of that last final parade ever in the British colony. Well, we can't turn up today, so there's not a lot else on the two points in it is March when Hong Kong stages its biggest sporting event, the World Rugby Tens and Sevens. It's an opportunity for the pipes and drums, a high-profile run-through for the big day. The bagpipes were originally at the forefront of battle, the sound intended to strike terror into the hearts of the enemy and stir the blood of the Scots. The tuning up process, thankfully, is done well away from the crowd or the stadium would empty in seconds. Watch pipes and drums travel the world to give performances, but never will they have an audience greater than that of Handover Day. Hundreds of TV crews will beam the parade around the world to an estimated two billion viewers. For a regiment rooted in history with long ties to Hong Kong, one would expect a degree of nostalgia at the forthcoming departure. Not so. A dignified withdrawal is a professional challenge, and there is no place for sentiment. It's been inevitable since 1983. Uh, it's been a long build-up, and this is this is this is history. This is it happening, and I certainly don't want to cling on to any last vestiges of empire. I think this can go on forever because that's that's nostalgic nonsense, as far as I'm concerned. We've got to get the handover done properly, um, give it out in as good order as possible, make sure we've got as strong a ties as we've got with with Hong Kong and with the Chinese government, so that um, uh, there can be good relations in the future. And our part in that is to do our bit correctly.
Many victims have fallen before the steamroller that is the real politic of transition. The very old were the first. Many have been abandoned by sons and daughters who chose to flee to new lands. The statistic of suicide amongst the elderly has reached a new high. The Helping Hand Centre, a charity supported home for the elderly. Here live a handful of the lucky ones. Hong Kong's special problem is its lack of building space. Property prices are the highest in the world. Charity groups cannot afford to build new homes. And for the first time, old people are seen sleeping on the streets, having given their savings to younger members of the family to start a new life abroad. Mr. Cheng was the principal of a Catholic school in Hong Kong until his recent retirement. He now shares a tiny living space with four others. His wife left him to live in America. It was not how he expected his retirement years to be. Mm-hmm. 因為在大陸的時間我們經歷過一段時間回去我見到很多年輕人都是不是令人開心的我感受呢凡是中國人很多很多都有同相同的感受handicapped are also taking their place high on the list of transition casualties. Countries like Canada and Australia do not welcome immigrant families with handicapped children. It might place a burden on their own welfare services. The result? The children are often simply left behind. The students will have no, nothing concerned with the transition because, because of their intelligent level or many other reasons, they may not be so aware of what's going on in the community and a direct effect on them. But occasionally, just like our students, some of the students will be left behind by the family because the family were so uncertain and feeling so un, not secure enough that they will immigrate. And they have problem if they try to bring and handicapped children with them because not many countries will accept the handicapped children because that will imply a very great burden to their community and, and the country. So it all depends on the degree of the handicap the children have. The problem of immigration is, is quite great if you think about every year how many people immigrate out of Hong Kong. And when I just try to count my experience with my handicapped students, I have a capacity of 40 students, but I have four cases already. Within a small school, we've only got 40 students. I got four students' family who will be facing this type of problem. The boy that 
with the with parents, with his sister and a brother immigrated to Taiwan. She, he actually can't speak because he's uh, suffering from cerebral palsy, but he can type with computer. And therefore, he will type with the computer to write a letter to the parent and ask, ask the school staff to help him to send the letter to Taiwan. And expressing that he want to go to Taiwan, he want to join the family, but the parents got no response. The parents make an effort to bring the dog with them to Taiwan, but haven't made an effort to bring the children with them. The mother make an effort to get the license, get everything, and bring the dog to Taiwan. And the boy is left behind in Hong Kong. This year, teachers and therapists were disappointed with the state welfare budget they were given. Critics claimed China had interfered in Hong Kong's internal affairs by demanding cutbacks in advance of the handover. Social workers now fear that standards of care in Hong Kong will fall away just at a time they are under greatest pressure. They have no concept of social service in China. I have visited some they call welfare center in China. It's just a place where they put everyone in the center, no matter what age, what kind of handicap, and they just give them things to eat and a place to sleep. This is all I can observe. It's already in Kong Chao. Yeah, it's already in a city which is quite, which is claimed to be well developed. All over Hong Kong, suitcases are being packed. Today, we'll see an exodus of British. The Oriana cruise ship has arrived in Hong Kong to carry them back to an England which many of them will barely recognize. Hong Kong has been their home for most of their working lives. Royston, Hazel and Alan are amongst them. This departure is for government officers. It's written into their contracts that they can cruise to Britain in luxury. Nothing can be more symbolic of the British demise than the sailing of this slow boat from China, and the world's press is waiting. Well, with all this, obviously it is. You'll see me cry in a few minutes. Um, Paul Allen's already had a tear in his eye. So is my wife outside. She's with my mother-in-law and her, my, my uh, sister-in-law, another sister-in-law. Quite a bit of the family are here. A final farewell from the band of the Hong Kong police with the inevitable bagpipes which so long ago entered Hong Kong tradition and have come to symbolize the strange blend of cultures which has taken place here. Britain is um, often uh, condemned for um, Hong Kong un unjustly. Uh, they've done wonders here. The greatest legacy will be the rule of law and uh, an open society. And we had the beginnings of a, of a, of a de democratic um, system, which I helped draft. So I think Britain should be congratulated. Just, just look around you. As Paul, Lord Palmerston said, what, 150 years or so? Barren rock. 
It's not a barren rock anymore. And a lot of that is due to a stable uh, society which um, obeys the rule of law. A sunset sailing, another countdown milestone is past. It was Deng Xiaoping who engineered the recovery of Hong Kong. He did not live to see it completed. It was a dream to reunite China. It was he who imagined the one country, two systems plan which would smooth the transition. It remains to be seen whether China can abide by this hands-off promise or whether the spread of Western ideals up into the mainland will be seen as too threatening to the communist leadership. Deng was not to see the arrival of the first contingent of the People's Liberation Army in Hong Kong, a small group of officers who've come to work with the UK forces and plan the installation of a 10,000-strong Chinese garrison in the British barracks. The relationship between incoming and outgoing forces is delicate. The impression is that the British government just wants to get out as soon and as smoothly as possible. Hong Kong's Democrats fear Britain has washed its hands of responsibility for the future of Hong Kong. After that, it's only the world's press which can provide any safeguards. Don't just cover Hong Kong for a few days, from maybe the 29th of June until the 2nd of July. I think you must keep a careful watch over Hong Kong, because that is only the beginning. And even in Shanghai, um, forty odd years ago, when the communists took over Shanghai, they allowed the business people to continue to work and make money. Uh, it's only three years later that they, that they took everything from them and put them into prison. So things would not happen on day one. But you better keep watch. Day 100, day 300, day 500. The Black Watch rugby team come face to face with the Chinese troops which will replace them. It's a trial of strength which each team is determined to win, a question of national honor. And the press can't help but see the symbolism of the moment. The countdown is now not until the final ceremony, it's to the kickoff. <laughs> 